Hi, I'm Matt Pai. I'm an operations manager here at AWS Support in Dublin. Welcome to Knowledge Center Live. I'm here with my colleague, Francesco Penta. Hi, everyone. My name is Francesco Penta. I'm a principal cloud support engineer based in Dublin as well. Um, so, uh, Matt, why don't you tell the audience what we're going to do and uh, talk about today? Yeah. So, first of all, why are we here? We're here to uh, ensure you know what AWS support has to offer and to help you find the right support when you need it, while ensuring you get the most out of AWS support. We're going to demo some use cases from AWS support value add to help you move faster and more securely in the cloud. And how we're going to do this, we're going to highlight some of the how AWS support helps you get the most from the cloud by giving you an overview of the AWS support offerings. We'll dive deeper into AWS support pillars of people, programs, and technology. And Francesca will demonstrate a use case from uh, the AWS health automation and utilizing automation, while I'll take you through some of the best practices while working with AWS support. So uh, during today's stream, um, we're going to paste some relevant links in the chat, and please feel free to ask any question relevant to the content. We'll try our best to answer via the chat or via the live stream. Um, with that said, uh, Matt, um, how can our customer get the most out of the cloud? Yeah, so first, let me take you back to 1964, when based on InnoSide corporate longevity forecast, the average lifespan of SAP 500 companies was 33 years, which dropped to 24 years in 2016, and is projected to be only 12 years by the year 2027. This means companies need to be agile, they need speed, and they need innovation. But as reported by Garner in 2019, the biggest inhibitor to cloud adoption is the lack of skills and companies just cannot hire or train fast enough. This is where AWS customer enablement services augment your team's cloud skills by delivering deep AWS expertise when, where, and how you need it. We have professional services to accelerate your business outcomes. We have AWS managed services to operate your AWS infrastructure, uh, AWS training and certification to build skills as well as va validating your AWS expertise. APN partners who are a global network with deep AWS expertise uh, and AWS IQ who are on demand help from AWS certified third party experts. And then we have AWS support, which is a team that myself and Francesco work for. So AWS support, we have the people, the technology, and the programs to partner with you to optimize, secure, and provide value add to your AWS environment. We do this by partnering with you to innovate at high speed, reduce risks and costs, optimize your environment, and focus on differentiating your business. So let's talk about what offerings AWS support have. At AWS, we have four uh, different support plans to provide you with the tooling and access to our expertise to enable you to be successful through your AWS journey. We have three paid support plans in developer support, which is aimed at customers testing or trialing AWS. Business support for customers who are running production workloads in AWS, and then enterprise support if you're running any business or mission critical workloads, or if you're running multiple production workloads. We also have basic support plan, which is free and available to all customers and to all AWS accounts. When you create an AWS support account, basic support is automatically assigned to the account, which provides customers 24 seven to our AWS customer service team to assist you with any account or bidding questions or issues, as well as um, access to the AWS support forums, where AWS and the community can discuss topics and ask questions. Basic support customers get limited access to Trusted Advisor, um, which is a tool that Francesco will be taking you through shortly, while also providing customers with access to the personal health dashboard, as well as the service health dashboard. The personal health dashboard provides customers with a personalized view uh, of the health of your AWS services. Everything that customers get with basic support then rolls up to developer support, which is the first of our paid support plans. It is from developer support where you get business hour access to our technical support engineers um, through Monday through to Friday. Um, 
our engineers who are there to help you with any general development questions and provide for support for non-critical issues that you may experience with the AWS uh, services. Our engineers will also provide you with building block architectural advice, as well as best practices and general guidance on the AWS services. This so is Mark, all... Sorry, ahead, Francesco. I just want to ask about this. Um, so it's not only reactive support. So what, what, can you expand a bit on the building block architecture support that our uh, customers will get? Yeah, sure. So um, this is a, a, um, a topic that I always talk about with our customers. Um, one advice I always give to our customers is always contact us before you do anything with AWS, whether that's your technical account manager, your solution architect, or us here at AWS uh, support. Uh, our support engineers are trained to provide architectural advice. Um, so from developer support, we provide building block advice, um, and I'll go through the different levels of architectural advice as we go through through the slides. Um, but uh, the main message here, always contact us before you do anything with AWS support, uh, before you do anything with the AWS services, and we can help to validate uh, your environment and help you to build for uh, failure, help you to build for scalability, and help to provide uh, the security best practices. Thank you, Matt. So from uh, developer support, our customers can contact us through email. Uh, this is through the AWS Support Center console, where one name contact can open unlimited cases with us. So this is definitely why you should contact us, because there's no limit to the amount of cases you, uh, you create with us. Then everything rolls up to the next level of our paid support plan, which is business support. It is from business support that customers get full access to Trusted Advisor and can access to the AWS Support API, providing programmatic access to the AWS Support Center and Trusted Advisor, as well as the uh, AWS Health API for integration with your existing management systems. Francesco will show you a demo utilizing both of these APIs shortly. From business support, customers can increase security by enabling least access privileges to AWS support for unlimited contacts. By utilizing IAM to open unlimited cases 24 seven to our cloud support engineers via email, phone call, and chats. Our engineers will partner with you to provide contextual use case guidance. So here we go deeper into the architectural guidance we provide uh, for your AWS infrastructure and a higher case priority for incidents, as well as support for the most popular third-party software on AWS. Customers also get paid access to our infrastructure event management program uh, to help you uh, plan for large-scale events, things like uh, infrastructure migrations, product launches, and marketing events. Continue with the trend, everything then rolls up to our highest support plan, which is enterprise support. Our enterprise support customers get access to the most critical support case priority and a named technical account manager who will proactively monitor your environment and assist with optimizing the environment, as well as coordinating access to the proactive and preventative programs like our infrastructure event management program, which is included with this support plan. You also get access to the operations and well-architected reviews. With enterprise support, the technical account manager and the, solution, uh, the subject matter experts will dive deep to provide uh, application architecture guidance in a consultative partnership, which can also include our solution architects and professional services consultants. Now we've gone over the support offerings, let's dive a bit deeper into AWS support. So in AWS support, we have three main pillars that we focus on to help, uh, help you use AWS to achieve your business outcomes. These pillars are people, programs, and technology. We have subject matter experts like our cloud support engineers who dive deep into the AWS services, as well as solution architects and our product teams who are available for guidance. Available to enterprise support customers we, uh, is uh, the support concierge and technical account managers. 
Our support concierge team are account specialists to support you with your account and uh, billing uh, subjects and technical account managers who are highly technical named contacts to support you achieve your business objectives by connecting with you and um, our experts to coordinate access to our programs like the uh, infrastructure event management, well architected reviews and operational reviews to help drive the value add of the AWS. IMS is a uh, infrastructure event management is a program that is stru uh, structured pre-planning for your critical events. If you are running a marketing campaign which will generate increased traffic to your applications, if you are launching a new product and it's critical that your environment is architected correctly to scale, we'll partner with you uh, through the planning and we have a team to actively monitor your resources and proactively jump in to resolve any issues uh, before they become customer impacting. Our technical account managers and solution architects are trained to deliver the well-architected reviews and operational reviews, which are a proactive program to provide you guidance and recommendations to design for, uh, design for uh, re resilience, uh, security, cost-effective, and optimized environments, providing you extra value add. We have many training platforms from in-house training, online training, as well as self-paced labs. Um, and we also have our certification pathways to help you upskill and become certified in AWS. The last of our pillar is uh, our technology pillar. This is where I'm going to hand over to Francesco to take you through uh, the, the technology that we provide customers. So Francesco will take you through the personal health dashboard and the, the AWS support API. Francesco, why don't you tell uh, the audience um, how these tools can help them? Thank you very much, Matt. So, um... As an engineer, um, technology is uh, my first and foremost passion, so that's why I wanted uh, to talk about this. Um, uh, we use technology at our core in AWS Premium Support to assist our customers, and a lot of the technology we use uh, has been uh, um, somehow uh, worked to be externalized to our customers. Um, um, we use a lot of internal tooling to help us assist you and uh, help identify uh, potential areas for improvement in your environment, and that's uh, where Trusted Advisor comes from. It's uh, um, an online resource, a full-fledged service that will help you through different areas, um, namely cost optimization, performance, security, and fault tolerance, and uh, also has a small section for uh, um, quotas and utilization of services. So the idea is that uh, uh, Trusted Advisor continuously scans um, your environment and looks across different checks for those four main areas um, and uh, gives you recommendation on uh, what you can do to improve uh, your um, environment. Uh, cost optimization might be one of the things that our customers love the most because we are actively uh, telling our customers where they can uh, save money. Um, uh, just as an example, um, we do look at the CPU utilization and networking utilization of the instances in your account. and uh, um, if they are falling under a certain threshold, we recommend you to actually use smaller instance types. Uh, smaller instance types usually cost less, and uh, by just following those recommendations, you will be able to, uh, to um, uh, optimize the cost that you're having on AWS. Similarly, uh, we look at performance as well and seeing what things you uh, should have uh, um, stronger reason types or different resources or scoping the resources for that. But uh, the, one of the things that I love the most is the focus on security. Uh, AWS uh, uses a shared responsibility model. Uh, our infrastructure and uh, the services that you're using and are secure and uh, audited by third party parties, but the, they can only be as secure as the application that you run uh, on AWS. You are responsible for your application and the security of the configuration of the, those resources. And that's where trust advisor is really handy. Uh, we'll scan all your resources uh, across a different number of checks and tell you what needs to be acted on. So for example, a wide open security group or a network ACL that's uh, uh, allowing uh, uh, more traffic than intended. Those will be all items that are highlighted 
in the um, trust advisor and the checks that it gives. And the last one is the fault tolerance. Um, it basically highlights all those elements that uh, could use a different configuration or where you might have a single point of failure. Um, and again, as a very small example would be EBS volumes where you haven't taken a snapshot for a long time or you never taken a snapshot. Uh, and again, trust advisor will give you a recommendation on, hey, you haven't taken a snapshot in quite a long time, you might want to take it. Uh, you can ignore checks if something that you're doing are by design, but in general, uh, you can uh, have an eagle eye view into the resources of your account. And that's particularly useful when your uh, infrastructure is growing and you are adding more and more resources and more people are working on it. This removes the heavy lifting that uh, required into ensuring that everything is running as it should be running and uh, as with our best practices and recommendations. Um, the second thing that I wanted to talk about today is uh, um, AWS uh, Health. Uh, this is a fully fledged services uh, service, and uh, you might know it uh, as the AWS Personal Health Dashboard. Uh, that's available to all uh, our customers. It's not limited to, to uh, business and enterprise support, um, um, and it gives you your um, view, the view into your resources, the status and the health of the resources and services uh, running in your account. Uh, you might be familiar with the Service Health Dashboard as well, where we will post uh, any operational issues that services might be having in any of the uh, regions that AWS runs into, uh, but that usually might be not very accurate to your use case. Uh, sometimes there might be some operational issues that you're not affected uh, by, and in that case, uh, um, why should you care about that notification? And, but sometimes there might be a single issue with one of your resources, and uh, we will not post that on the service health dashboard. So what AWS Health does is giving you a personalized view of the health of the service and how that uh, uh, compares to your resources. Um, not only that, it will also give you proactive notification in case of uh, maintenance windows or anything that we should tell and or that you should know about your resources, but also um, detailed troubleshooting guidance. So what to do next? In that case, something is impacted, uh, what action you should take? So Francesco, to... sure. Uh, can you just uh, clarify the, the difference between the personal health dashboard and the service health dashboard? So if there's an alert on the service health dashboard, you mentioned that this may not impact customers. Uh, well, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. Um, so what will happen here is that uh, you will be able to see the service health dashboard issue on your personal health dashboard, but you will also be given a list of the resources that are impacted. For example, if uh, something is happening in a specific AZ, but you have non, no resources running in that AZ, uh, you will see that in the AWS health and you will see that there are no resources impacted by that specific event. Vice versa, um, um, if there's something ongoing and only a few of your resources that are affected, you will see how that resource is affected and uh, along with the next steps on what to do next. Um, as with all the other services, you can use IAM uh, to control access to the personal dashboard. You have organizational view, so where you can look at the status and the health of all accounts in your AWS organization. And with business and enterprise support, you also have access to the API, which is something that we're going to talk in a second. So the last thing that I want to talk uh, about today before we move to the demo is uh, the AWS uh, support API. So uh, AWS support API um, are nothing special compared to the other two things that we're talking about, uh, but they do offer access to everything that you can see from the console in a, uh, and allowing you to use programmatic access to manage those. And in that case, uh, for the support API, the uh, first thing that comes to mind is the ability of uh, um, managing cases, so opening support cases with us and looking at the status, add attachment, and so on. But it also gives you access to the trusted advisor checks if you wish to build out mission around that and to the uh, AWS Health API as well. Um, we'll look in a second at the demo and now we can integrate with support APIs and now we can uh, leverage all of that um, um, uh, using the support APIs. But again, um, case automation, um, trusted advisor and the health uh, access are the three things that uh, you will be able to use uh, and this is available to business and enterprise uh, customers. Uh, will not be available for a developer customer. So um, now um, I think 
one thing that I wanted to show you today is a use case for AWS Health. Um, before we dive into this, uh, I just want to give a couple of notes uh, for um, this specific demo. So this is part of one of the demos that uh, we have available on our GitHub repositories. We have two, and Matt is going to uh, post those in the chat in a second. Um, but those two GitHub repositories give you an idea and a few um, um, examples of, for uh, integration with the, the Trusted Advisor tools and the, the AWS Health uh, tools. Uh, basically, a collection of both step-by-step -step guides and the cloud formation templates to get you started and give you a few ideas on how to integrate with that. In the specific, uh, today we're going to talk about the um, um, abuse automation. So, um, the is a, abuse events are a, a specific uh, um, uh, a subset of uh, AWS Health event uh, that allow you to that um, are sent by our abuse team to notify about the status of uh, um, resources in your account. So what this means, as we said, um, AWS is a shared responsibility model um, that you might uh, get in a situation where either you misconfigured the software running on your instances or uh, there is a, a vulnerability on some of the software, or it might be that you're just doing excessive web crawling, uh, anything from uh, copyright notices, uh, all the reasons listed in here uh, might trigger an abuse event. So it's our way of telling you, hey, uh, we have detected that something's going on with this specific resource. You might want to act on it. And as with everything with AWS Health, you'll get uh, a notification and you'll get uh, uh, some remediation actions. So when that happens, uh, you can also see uh, on the uh, blog post uh, um, that's linked above, Matt will um, uh, post that in the chat as well, uh, can get a bit more information uh, regarding the events and why we do send those. The idea is that we'll capture one of these events using the event bridge and uh, then take some action on it. Um, so here you can see the um, architectural diagram for um, what we're going to build uh, today. And again, this will be available uh, and is still available on our GitHub uh, repository. Um, as a personal dashboards, we'll integrate it with CloudWatch events and the event bridge. Uh, what we'll do is to configure CloudWatch events to capture one of those events, run um, a Lambda function uh, that uh, we brought and uh, have it uh, send uh, an email notification to our team. Um, so we have an incident response, fake incident response team that will have to um, take action, but also do some automation on our instances. We'll differentiate our instances in between uh, developer instances and production instances. And uh, when we detect that the instance is uh, not really that important because it's just used for development of our tools or our website, um, will uh, uh, stop it automatically. So that uh, if that was the only target of the abuse notification, maybe someone was trying something out and forgot to, to close security groups, or um, it was just simply a developer mistake, we can stop it so that our team doesn't have to think about it. And um, that would be our first part of the automation. So um, before um, doing this, I'll switch to my um, console and uh, I will start talking a bit about this. So, and um, for anyone who's interested, sorry, Francesco, for anyone who's interested, the um, icons that Francesco has used to create this infrastructure diagram are openly available to all customers. So I'm just posting the link into the chat. So if you are interested to create your own infrastructure diagrams, you can follow the, the link in the chat um, and create your own uh, infrastructure diagrams to include all the approved AWS icons. Thank you, Matt. So, um, yeah, they are quite useful and handy as well. I use those uh, all the time when driving, when the, um, designing diagrams. It also helps a lot more uh, communicating with our customers when we are trying to um, uh, give them a suggestion for an architecture around they should build with our services. So, uh, to go back to the demo, this will be a live demo. Um, we have a couple of instances that I spun up in advance. Um, they're not really important, just two T2 Nano, and I call them a production one and development one. Um, the first thing I'm doing in one of the automation best practices uh, is to define context. So, we don't want to our automation to run everywhere, but just on things that we want to run on. Um, in this case, we are defining it context using tags. As you can see, here, uh, we tagged the instance with uh, um, a key pair that's uh, stage to indicate the stage we're on, and then uh, um, the value dev for development instances. And if we go to the production instance, we'll have the stage and then the prod. So um, that's just to find what the context we're going to operate on and what we're going to act on. 
So the first thing that we're going to do here um, is to create a simple uh, notification um, service topic. So what this is, um, is uh, um, for those who are not familiar with SNS, is a, a service that allows you to uh, create topics to send notifications to, and those topics can be subscribed by different subscribers, different actors to um, receive a notification when we want to tell them something. In this case, um, um, we subscribed our incident team email address. And uh, uh, what happens is that when we're going to send a notification, they are going to receive an email uh, with the subject and the message that uh, um, uh, we want to send. So um, what we want to do here is that, first of all, have the ARN or Amazon resource name um, uh, unique identifier for this resource, because we're going to use it in uh, um, uh, a minute. So uh, we have to do this beforehand because we'll use this in our Lambda function. Now, uh, second thing we're going to do is to uh, create our Lambda function. So I created it already, uh, but we're just going to have a brief look over it. So um, the first thing is uh, um, having a look at the um, uh, the uh, environment variables that we have. And you can see here that I pasted the SNS topic that we created beforehand. Um, we are not defining that in the code. We are just using it uh, um, uh, as an environment variable. So if we want to change our automation or we want to change the topic, we don't have to touch any of the code. We also have a couple other uh, variables that indicated the value of the tags we're looking at. In this case, would be prod and stage. So Francesco. Sure. Uh, just before you go on, so we've been talking about uh, security here. So uh, during your demo, we can see kind of the ARNs or and um, some IDs. Is this should be uh, kept secret? Um, no, as with everything, we don't really believe in security through obscurity. So the fact that those are visible doesn't really mean anything to a third party if we have configured our permissions in the correct way. Um, so we only giving, and we'll see that in a second, the permission to the topic to be posted from our account. And we're giving permission to our Lambda function only to post that topic. So the fact that you can see topic doesn't mean that anyone can do anything with it. And as with, usual, as with everything, uh, the fact that it's visible doesn't really give the attacker any other right, um, uh, potential uh, surface for attack. Uh, we're just using it with the proper practice and security and proper permission to those topics. And thank you for the question. So um, second thing that we're going to do, um, going back to what Matt was saying, is that looking at the permissions that we gave to this uh, Lambda function, um, we're going to click through the permission here. I pre-created a role, and we have a look at that in IAM, but we can see that we have permission to CloudWatch logs, and those are the, by default the permission that is given to any uh, Lambda function, uh, allows the Lambda function to log to CloudWatch logs, everything that we wanted to log. Uh, we have a permission for SNS, and in this case, you can see in here that he only has permission to publish and only to the topic that we gave. So if we wanted to use another topic, we couldn't. And then we have uh, permissions for EC2. And in this case, we're giving it the permission to describe instances and to stop instances. And this is because uh, we want to describe instances to look at the tags that an instance has and then stop instances for uh, stopping those instances that we determine through our automation that we want to be stopped. Uh, this is a purposefully quite wide as permission. This could take action on any EC2 instance. And I did this to keep it simple. We could further define context by giving it uh, permission only instances in a specific VPC or in a specific region or with specific tags. So we could use um, the leverage IAM to further narrow it down so that our automation can only execute on some action. So we should, could also do this so that it cannot even be able to stop a production instance, even if you wanted to. But in this case, we just wanted to, to keep it simple. So um, last thing that I want to do here is to look at the code, actually. So I'll go back to the configuration. And it will load the function. Uh, so this is in Python. Um, the reason why I wrote this in Python while the example is in JavaScript is because I'm a bit more familiar with uh, uh, Python as a programming language. Um, the functionality is basically the same, and uh, you can refer to the JavaScript example. But if anyone is interested in the Python code, um, please uh, reach out right in the chat, and we'll um, um, see to update that in the GitHub example as a, an extra language. So um, what we're doing here is uh, something that's quite easy. I will not go over all the code. Um, uh, just for interest of time, we'll look at the more interesting um, uh, things. Uh, but we go first with the entry point for our function, which is our uh, 
uh, Lambda handler um, that will receive the event and the context, uh, context from the Lambda invocation. So in here, uh, we have uh, three things that we're doing. Um, so we're parsing the event message, and we'll have a look into that um, in a second. Um, this basically is allowing us to grab the event from uh, CloudWatch events, and in this case from abuse, and put it in a format that's a bit easier for us, especially if we want to reuse the automation and the, we, we want to remove some information that's not really needed for us. Um, we have another function that's publishing the SNS notification to our team and then uh, actions. And we'll have a look at these uh, later in the second half when we're integrating with the support API. So for now, we're just going to remove it. So if we go and look in a bit more details at the um, actual code that we have in here, um, we have, uh, uh, it's quite simple. Um, again, this is not production grade. It's very simplistic in terms of uh, exception handling and what we're doing. We're not using any logging. We are just using the console and so on. But just to give you an example, I just want to warn you in case you wanted to use this in your production environment directly. So in this case, um, it's a JSON structure that we're receiving. Uh, we contain details. We're copying these in a variable name details. And also, we are going to uh, create a message that's uh, um, the concatenation of both the description of the event and the list of instances that are being affected. If there's being an issue, we're going to throw an exception, do nothing. Otherwise, we're just going to return what we just crafted from the function. Second thing we're doing is then uh, publishing an SMS notification. And this is, uh, you see how surprisingly easy it is to do this. Uh, we're getting the details that we created in the parse event details beforehand. And then we're going to create um, the data structure that will contain uh, the information required for uh, the API to publish the resource. And we just need the SNS ARN. Uh, if you look at what we looked before, uh, the SNS ARN is what we defined as an environment variable. And we are declaring, declaring this uh, at the top of the code. And then we're putting in the message, the content of the email address, and in the subject, the um, name of the event name that we are receiving. And we could change it. We could uh, craft it in a way that's more appealing to our developers, but we're going to keep it simple. Next thing we're doing is we're using the Boto3 library. Boto3 is uh, one of the Python SDK. We have SDKs available for um, all the uh, major languages. Um, that's uh, um, uh, Support APIs is available in all of those SDKs. And you're going to instantiate an SNS client using the default US East one region. And as you can see, we're not giving it any credential. Uh, the, the library is smart enough to look at the credential from the um, um, actual execution context and looking that from the uh, credentials and permissions that we gave um, at the, our Lambda by using the role associated with the, um, the um, Lambda function. Second thing is we're going to publish the function and we'll use this and just send out our uh, message. Last thing, and I will go a bit less onto this because there's a bit of uh, Python in here to um, look at the instances, uh, removing just the instance IDs, uh, which is this part. But what the interest is us is the, uh, calling the EC2 client, uh, in this case, instantiating it, and then calling the scribe instances for the list of instances that we just uh, had before. From there, uh, we look at the response. And then from that response, we're going to look at the tags that are associated with uh, our instances and then uh, add them into different lists. One is the production instances that we don't want to touch, and then the other instances, which is the instances that we're going to act on. So if we have any instances that uh, meet that criteria, then we're just going to call stop instances and uh, with the list of instances IDs and then print it out. So that's all our automation is going to do today. Um, last thing before we test this out is that we'll have to create the CloudWatch event bridge in here. And uh, um, we created these already. Um, we'll have a look in here. So CloudWatch uh, event bridge is an extension of CloudWatch events, allows you also integration with third party products, but basically uh, works fundamentally the same as CloudWatch events. Um, you can see the uh, details about what we created, but the important thing here is the event pattern. So basically what we are going to uh, be invoked on um, is based on what matches this event pattern. And you can see that as a source, we defined the AWS health, um, the detail type, uh, we have the AWS health abuse event. And again, a few other details that uniquely identify these uh, specific uh, um, um, events that we want to uh, be invoked on. And the second thing that we have defined in here is to have a target. So what's going to happen when this event is matched? And in this case, would be the, our AWS Health uh, demo Lambda function that we created beforehand. So the order for us would be to create the SNS notification, then the Lambda function, 
uh, then uh, going to glue that together with the uh, event bridge or CloudWatch events. If so we want to go. Sure. Um, just going back to the code, how much of the code did you have to create yourself versus how much of the code uh, is available in the blog? Uh, so uh, the, the code available in the blog post and uh, GitHub is all there. Um, I just have to code all everything because it's Python, uh, but uh, you can run these with the code that's in there. It's already available for people to just copy and paste and start experimenting on. So um, going back to the uh, demo, we could try this with the test event. Um, we will have to modify our event pattern. And the reason is because AWS is a reserved namespace, so we cannot take an AWS event. Um, so we are going to take a shortcut here rather than modifying it and sending a test event. We're going to test this directly from the Lambda function. So if we go back to Lambda, uh, Lambda gives you um, 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 the ability of testing um, your uh, function by simulating an event. So what is the input that will be invoked with? We prepared it already, but before we run, uh, so let me save this first, but before we run it, I want to show you what is the uh, test event that I configured. And as you can see here, this is uh, what an AWS abuse event will look like. So you have the detail type, the source, uh, the time is being received, um, the instances for which uh, this event was related on, um, the ARN of the event, and a bit more information that will be generated when the event is created. So what happens here is that um, this would abuse event uh, will look like. Uh, we created a fake one because we don't really want to expose our instances or leave them open and wait for one to happen. Uh, but that's it. So we're going to um, close this and then test it out by clicking test. And if everything goes well, the function will start executing in here and will give us success. So if we look at the details, we'll have a bit of information regarding the, uh, the data in here. And if we go and look back at the EC2 instances and refresh this, we should see that one has been stopped. And that's where our automation comes into place. Additionally, if we go to work mail and look at the inbox for our team, uh, we have a notification that we just received which has the content that we crafted in our automation. So we have the message, the title of the event, and then the instances that are related so that our team can be aware of it. You are not limited by email. You can use HTTPS endpoints. You can use a Lambda as well. You can integrate with whatever uh, ticketing system your team or paging system your team is using. But the idea is that uh, from the event, we are just notifying the right people rather than trying to notify the entire company. So um, um, hopefully that gave you um, uh, good uh, um, ideas on how to use AWS Health for automate uh, some of the uh, work away from your team and uh, allow you to respond a bit faster when anything should happen to your resources. I'll now leave it to Matt um, to talk a bit about the support best practices and uh, what are the best thing to do when engaging with the Prim support. So thanks, Francesco. Um... So I'm just going to grab the screen back. Um, and as Francesco said, I'm just going to quickly take you through some of the uh, best practices when using or contacting AWS support. So when you actually contact us, uh, the uh, support center provides you access to tools and expertise to ensure the success um, and the operational health of your AWS solutions. Um, you can use the search bar for any AWS support resource, create a support case, and view all your past and existing support cases. You also have quick uh, view access to um, the health events of your AWS resources and findings from Trust Advisor, while it provides you quick access links to both Trust Advisor and the personal health dashboard. From the Support Center console, uh, you can also navigate to Knowledge Center articles and video tutorials to, uh, to help you learn um, about more about the AWS services and how to troubleshoot them while answering some of the most frequently asked questions that we receive from customers. But as you know, the principle of uh, cloud security is the principle of least access privileges. Uh, by such, uh, by default, IAM users do not have access to the AWS Support Center. But by utilizing IAM, you can grant access to the Support Center while restricting access uh, IAM uh, to specific users. Um, this uh, IAM access, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is from business support and uh, upwards. So business support and enterprise support. Uh, 
So uh, example one shows a policy to allow full access to the AWS Support Center, uh, including the APIs, where uh, example two denies the IAM user from resolving support cases. Following the principle of least privilege, I would recommend that you only provide access to those who need it. So if you have an IM user that you do not want to create support cases, you can actually provide them read-only access. So how do you go about creating a support case? You go to the support center console, you click create a case, and if you have a paid support plan, uh, developer, business, or enterprise support, you have the option to create a technical support case. Otherwise, you will only have access to create a, a case to our AWS customer service team for account and billing support or for service limit increases. You can, um, Upgrade to uh, developer support and uh, business support or enterprise support through the AWS support console. And there's no long-term contracts that you are tied to when uh, with our paid support plans. Um, so for first, you need to select the correct service and the category and severity while including as much detail as possible. This will enable our cloud support engineers to dive straight in as our engineers do not have access to your environment. Um, in AWS, uh, security is our job zero. And this links back to the shared responsibility model that Francesco uh, talked about earlier. If you require real-time interaction with our cloud support engineers, then with business and enterprise support customers, you have the option to contact us via live chat or phone call. It is worth noting that our phone option is a callback service, so you don't actually pay for contacting us. Uh, although our engineers do not have access to your environment, they can initiate a screen sharing session, which is a viewer access only, to understand the problem in more detail. Again, we partner with you uh, to troubleshoot together and to resolve the issue. Um, it is. Uh, very important that you do select the right uh, support severity level. So our support cases severities uh, range from a 24 hour first response uh, to a 15 minute first response time. Developer support customers have access to general guidance and system impaired, which is a 12 and 24 hour uh, uh, severity level. Um, Business support customers get access to an additional two severities in production system impaired and production system town, which are four and one hour severities. And then for our enterprise support customers, you get a fifth uh, severity option of business critical system down, which has a first response time of 15 minutes. For enterprise support customers, in the case of production system down or business critical system down, your technical account manager will get paged to alert them of the high severity issue, and they can practically jump in um, and work with our um, support engineers to dive deeper and to troubleshoot and hopefully resolve the issue. So, um, I mentioned uh, before, so with uh, when raising a support case, it is uh, important that you provide as much detail as possible. This will allow our support engineers to dive in straight away, and this will actually prevent the back and forth with you to gather more information. Um, so the information that uh, would be useful to us to help us to start troubleshooting any issue um, is any specific identifier. So the EC2 instance ID, S3 bucket name, the CloudFormation stack ID, anything that can help us to uh, narrow down the issue uh, further. Um, also the region and the availability zone that your resource or service uh, is operating in. Um, give us a, an idea if this is an ongoing issue or if the issue is in the past. If so, provide us the uh, context of the time and the date that it occurred. Again, this could help us to narrow down the issue to a specific time and date. Um, 
provide us with as much troubleshooting uh, information that you've already done. So if you've got any logs, trace routes, packet captures, API errors, any screenshots, anything you can actually provide us will help us to uh, narrow down the issue and to react faster to help you to resolve your any issues you're facing. Um, also, if you're asking for architectural guidance, uh, provide us some sort of idea. So if you've got architectural um, diagrams, this will be great. And again, it will help us to dive straight in. Depending on uh, the level of architectural advice you need, um, AWS support uh, will partner with the um, AWS Solution Architect, um, our Solution Architects, to uh, work with you um, in cases that it goes beyond the scale of AWS support. Um, also, as I mentioned, it is important to uh, select the right uh, service category and severity when raising a support case. But security is first. So before you actually provide us anything, any logs, trace routes, do sanitize anything before sending it to us. Also, never include your username or password to your environment or your secret key or access key to any of your resources. Again, security first. Our AWS support engineers will never ask you for these information. So it will never ask you for your secret key or access key or your username or password. Just thank you, Matt. I just wanted to add that the, the, since the security is paramount with AWS Premium Support, we have absolutely zero access to any of your customer data. We'll only be able to see, and only when you're contacting us, um, metadata. So instance IDs or um, um, load balancer names, we'll never be able to see access logs or anything else or any of the traffic going through your system. That's why it's very important to provide that information in, again, in a sanitized way when you're contacting us, reducing the back and forth. The idea is that uh, if we have logs to look at, if we have data that's coming from your environment, that will make our life way easier in supporting you and also um, greatly reducing the amount of time it takes to get resolution. Because if we, since we have no access to the data and sometimes we do have customers that think that we might have, but we absolutely have not, um, um, they think that, oh, um, I have problems with my website, can you go and check it? Um, we probably don't know what your website is, which instance is running on, uh, what are the logs, and what are the issues that might be left in there. So that's why it's extremely important. And to add on what Matt was saying regarding the severity um, of the um, cases, uh, definitely shorter response time are always useful, but uh, be very mindful when doing that because we do love to prioritize. And if you're opening a lot of high severity cases uh, th that are not really critical, then the one that's really important might just leap through the many that you're opening. So the, for having the right thing and the right support case, it definitely helps a lot uh, uh, getting to resolution uh, faster and uh, with the, the, the right level of attention that uh, your issue uh, requires. Yeah. And our support engineers are uh, trained experts into kind of troubleshooting the AWS services. Um, but if you do provide us with all this information, it will help us to dive in a lot quicker. Um, so I've seen uh, customers come in with issues uh, for their EC2 instance, which because it's one of our uh, larger services, uh, it's not a, a a uh, unique uh, thing we see. Um, but a customer came in, all they stated in their support case was, my e I have an issue with my EC2 instance. Um, so I got that support case, um, I uh, checked our internal tools, and it turned out that this customer had thousands of EC2 instances. Um, so to try to narrow down the, the issue was, was difficult. So I was doing um, what I could to try to identify a, a, any issue with an EC2 instance ID, and all the EC2 instances were reporting healthy. So I had to get back to that customer and ask them, can you provide me the instance ID? They provided me an instance ID, but it wasn't actually an EC2 instance ID um, that, uh, or that was in their account. So I had to dive deeper, and I found out that that EC2 instance ID had been terminated. So diving deeper, I found out it had been terminated by an IM user uh, from that customer's account. Turned out they uh, terminated the instance because um, they they had an issue with it, and they just spun up another one. They, they uh, designed correctly for failure, so they just spun up another EC2 instance ID. But this um, back and forth with that customer that was uh, over uh, quite a few hours because we was doing it via email. 
if that customer provided the EC2 instance ID, gave me more context, I could have actually resolved that uh, uh, case a lot sooner. So again, provide us with as much information as you can. We can actually get back to you with um, a uh, more thorough response a lot faster. Thank you, Matt. Okay. So, so I'm now, to... yeah. So now, yeah, we've gone through that. Uh, Francesco, do you want to take uh, take over and go through uh, another demo? Absolutely. Thank you, Matt. Um, so I'm going to share my screen again, and uh, then we're going to um, do a small extension of the uh, demo that we looked at before. So we talked quite a bit about the AWS uh, support APIs, but we haven't really shown anything. And what I wanted to do here is to show you how easy it is to um, actually uh, implement support API um, to, to open a case and um, ask for the best spring support health when, that, when we're running that automation that we saw before. So if we go and look at the um, actual uh, architectural diagram, we're just making a small like, extension here and uh, we just added a bit of piece here, which is the AWS support integration. So what this means is that we're um, running our automation as usual, um, but then when we are going to um, notify our team, we're also going to open a support case for the production instance that uh, we had an issue with. Because uh, again, we don't really care about our developer instance, we're just stopping it so that our team can take action uh, when they're back in the office or when they will have the proper uh, time to deal with it. But in this case, we want to ask support for admise. And uh, this is a, a quite of a generic, request that we're making to support by saying, hey, we just received these AWS uh, abuse events, what do we should do about it? So I'll switch now to my uh, browser and uh, um, go and look at the um, um, automation that we had before. So um, what we're going to do here uh, is to just add the, the extra bit that we removed earlier that that's telling us that we have uh, an actual result that, uh, so we have an instances in this list, so there's a production instance. We're going to call and invoke the function contact support uh, with that list of instances. So what we can do here um, is to write this small function and uh, instantiate a client for the su support uh, API and then create a message. In this case, so we're just writing something along the lines. We have received an abuse notification for those instances. Can you please recommend what the next steps are? And make this a bit bigger. And uh, then uh, um, similar to what we did with the, the um, SNS notification is to create the um, parameters required to invoke that API. In this case, we're creating a test case. We're going to do this uh, against our live system. So we want to notify our engineers that this is not it's just a tool. Um, the severity would be normal for the same reason. We're adding the message. And then uh, since those are Linux instances, we're going to open these in the Linux queue. And they can use the uh, describe uh, services and describe category codes to get the, from the API to get uh, the uh, appropriate values to use in here. And we're going to open it with the general guidance. Um, we're invoking the create case. And uh, if uh, we have uh, a successful response, what we're going to do is to describe that case um, because uh, uh, there's a bit of difference in the human system, which uses a short uh, numeric uh, uh, system to indicate cases and the, the API, which is a longer system. So this allows us to get the um, smaller human readable ID and then use that to craft a link that will be sent to our team so they can figure it out and they can check that case from their uh, console by just clicking the email. Last thing we're going to do is to um, wait, uh, send the team a notification that uh, says, hey, we created a case on your behalf. And then wait five seconds, which is not something you should do in Lambda. This is against all best practices. Uh, we don't, you pay by execution time. So whenever you can avoid it, do not sleep in your Lambdas. But in this case, we're just doing it to ensure that the case is created and then we give it time to resolve, just waiting for five seconds. So before we run this, we'll have to save it, but we also need to uh, modify the permission uh, for this uh, because we have no permission to use its support API. And again, this is in the uh, principle of list privileges. Uh, we'll go to the IM management console. Uh, we'll click edit policy. So we're just using an inline policy for ease of use and then uh, um, modify the JSON. We can see already we have AC2, SNS, and the CloudWatch logs required action that we saw before. We go back to JSON and then uh, scroll down. We'll add uh, um, the um, right level of permissions and we'll add this as statement immediately after the uh, create log groups. 
and of this year. So what we have here is an action for all cases or create case, describe cases, and resolve cases for the support API. So that's basically extra permission that our, our function has and that we could use to create a case. We'll click review policy, and then it will give us a summary of the policy and we'll save the changes. Last thing that we're doing now that we have the changes, let's go back to Lambda. We saved it before, and we'll have a look at the actual permissions just to see that everything is okay. And from the drop down, we'll have to um, reload the page for a second. Uh, this was still the old page. But we'll have a uh, um, look at the um, permissions. And we see that uh, beside the uh, logs, EC2 and SMS, we also have the support um, uh, resources. And uh, we did the three um, um, APIs that uh, we want to invoke. So we'll go back ahead and click test again. And this will take a bit longer to run just because we had that five second sleep. But as soon as this completes, um, it should give us the green light and see that everything went okay, unless we uh, misconfigure something. And we see that uh, we have it in here, we have some logs, but more importantly, we can go and look at CNR email. We got, uh, I'll refresh this in here, we got the abuse report, that same that we had before and then the new notification we sent. And this is the one that we crafted uh, from the uh, case ID that uh, we created before. So this is something that we're telling our team, hey, we created a case. And if we click in here, uh, we'll be deep linked to the uh, actual console, uh, the support console, the one that you can use to regularly create cases. And you see these uh, um, is the case that we created with W support to get assistance on the abuse event that we received. As you can see, it's closed because we closed that on purpose, but you will see uh, that uh, uh, in here we have uh, received an abuse notification for our production instance that we have in here, and then we're asking basically for it. So this should give you an idea of what you can do with support APIs. Uh, that's not the only use case for automatic automatic case creation. You could integrate these with uh, your internal um, um, uh, incident management system, your ticketing system, or anything, so that your user do not have to go to a different console in the AWS support console, but rather they can have everything in one side. Uh, some of our customers, for example, are integrating with support APIs so that they can use their um, product to um, uh, basically uh, chat with their team internally. And then uh, when they uh, realize that they need the support help, they just click a button and the case with all the history and context that uh, it's uh, uh, required is automatically opened with the premium support and they handle everything from uh, a single interface. So um, that's uh, um, um, everything from my side for this demo. Hopefully so you found um, so just a quick question. So that was a live support case. So if you hadn't have set it up to resolve, that would have gone to one of the support engineers? Or Absolutely. is this a test system? Well, no, it, it is the uh, fully fledged uh, um, support console. Uh, one of the things that I did though, even if it got routed to someone in the brief amount of time that uh, it was open is to put a test case so people will know not to act on it. Uh, but yeah, it was against our live system. I'm using a regular account. There's nothing special about the account I'm using. And uh, it's just an account that they created for the purpose of these uh, uh, Twitch show and this demo. But uh, that's it. Against our live system, uh, you see it just takes a single API call to open a support case, uh, nothing else. And uh, likewise, it's quite easy to close it and describe it and do anything that you would like to do. Uh, there's a few systems that are ready to integrate with the, the support APIs, um, um, but it's extremely easy to use and integrate in your uh, workflow. So as we're saying, uh, hopefully that gave you a few ideas on how to use this and uh, that gave you um, uh, some uh, good ideas for automation, not only for the support APIs, but also WS Health. And uh, um, you can find other demos and examples on the, the GitHub pages. Uh, that's everything from our, our side. Um, um, if you have any questions, please post those in the chat. Um, we will uh, also send any feedback you might have um, to the uh, KC-Live address at amazon.com. I uh, will show up on the screen in a second. Thank you very much for following this and uh, happy cloud computing.